So some of the things that we were seeing, so I'll remind you, we had team meetings, the schools had team meetings once a month, and a researcher or research assistant was at most of those meetings recording, um, audio recording, not video recording, and listening to the conversation, listening to the kinds of things that the team members were doing, and uh, it was very interesting. So what we want to do is just talk a little bit about an overview of what some of the teams actually worked on and some of the practices. And you had a glimpse of that this morning in terms of the sorts of things that they were doing. There was a lot of talk, particularly at the beginning of our project, two years about, ago, about engaging, uh, student engagement and growth mindset. And we know that that's a bit of a buzz around, up around the province, or certainly was two years ago and probably still is continuing on from some of the work that some researchers have done, like uh, Carol Duick and Joe Bowler and some of those others. So some schools were working on developing a growth mindset and different kinds of ways of thinking about doing that. Some of the talk about developing a growth mindset was not just about student growth mindset, it was also about teacher growth mindset and that understanding that when we give kids some space, they actually are capable of quite a bit, and it was thinking about those kinds of things. You probably heard this morning about some ideas around reorganizing or rearranging the curriculum, and that could be done sort of really on a big scale or grand scale, or it might have been done on a smaller scale where people were maybe thinking about, you know, rather than start with algebra, I think I'm going to start with geometry and throw, build in some algebraic concepts through geometry or different kinds of things that people were doing in terms of thinking about that. Another thing we saw is people were blurring the lines between applied and academic. And what I mean by that, that again could be done in a variety of ways. It could have to do with the idea that um, what if we put both of those courses together, what might that look like? Or it could have been that quite often what we saw is people who are working on specific strategies in their grade nine applied course said, hmm, I think I might try this in my grade nine academic and found out that that was quite successful. Or in their grade 10 applied, or in their grade 10 academic, or some in their grade 12 courses. So some of that was moving over and shifting those practices to others. Some shifting around in terms of assessment practices. So looking at if I'm changing the kinds of things that I'm doing in instruction, it feels like I need some other kinds of shifts in terms of how I assess students. So you will be hearing about some of those ideas in terms of that. It could be a focus on learning goals and success criteria, or it could be using different formats of assessment or developing more formative assessment practices. <coughs> we found as people move from year one to year two, they started to spread out a little bit in the sense that, hey, let's pull in the grade seven and eight teacher. Maybe we'll pull in the grade 10 teacher, some reach to grade six teachers to think about, let's look at that continuum of learning. Integration of technology, I think just about every school was looking at what are some ways as part of student engagement and making some of the ideas more meaningful, what are some ways to integrate technology. Rich tasks, I suspect you heard a lot about some different kinds of rich tasks this morning. So there was a lot of work around Designing them, finding them, changing them, shifting them, trying them out, and um, sharing how that worked. As well as a focus on new ways of thinking about algebraic thinking. Assessment seemed to be a continued challenge. Um, so again, this grew out of, as I change my instruction, how do I change my assessment? So in many cases, there was a much greater focus in terms of looking at student thinking. And a lot of that had to do with, okay, let's bring our student work and let's look at this together. And so in many cases, it was not looking at what the lesson was designed around. It's what, is the, what do the kids understand? What does their thinking look like? And how do I build on that? Different cases had different things. Some looked at portfolio assessment. Some looked at incorporating more formative assessment practices. Um, some looked at co-construction of rubrics or learning goals and success criteria. So many different things around shifting assessment practices. Um, some school did the amazing EQAO race where they ran around the school and solved problems or worked on portfolios, as I mentioned, or you see there a sample of some success criteria, so the kinds of things that they worked on there. 
this continuum of learning across grades, as I mentioned. They were working with grade 7 and 8 teachers or grade 10 teachers to be able to support. They spent a lot of time looking at the curriculum. So what do they do in grade 7 and 8? Many people looked at how does a language change? Because quite often in grade 9, we're doing things like tables of values, not realizing that the kids have actually done this before, but have called them T-charts. So sometimes we shift the vocabulary, and our students feel as though this is a whole new thing. But actually, they've been doing it for quite a long time. And really thinking about, as they talk to grade 7 and 8 colleagues, what are some of the strategies that are used in grade 6, 7, and 8 that might be useful to be used in grade 9 and 10? So looking at that continuum. As well, thinking about the idea of how does this mathematical idea grow? So it's not just about what are the strategies, but how does the math grow across those grades? And sometimes we look at an expectation in a particular grade, and we try to do everything around that particular topic. Whereas if we look back, we actually realize that they've approached this topic before, and really all I have to focus on is, so what's new? What is the new piece that I actually am introducing? So that I'm not spending a lot of time redoing what hopefully has already been done. They also looked at trying a task across a variety of grades and bringing together student work. So let's try out this border problem. Or let's try out this particular task that we're taking from a Dan Meyer video, and let's see what does this look like in grades 7 and 8 and 9 and 10. So it's looking at that continuum. <coughs> mathematical thinking tools. Manipulatives are mathematical thinking tools. Technology is mathematical thinking tool. Um, a piece of graph paper is a mathematical thinking tool. So while there was a lot of work around the integration of technology, I think one of the biggest mathematical thinking tools that emerged in this study had to do with whiteboards. Like, we, I mean, we sold out Home Depot, I'm sure, in terms of buying big whiteboards. Because what happened was that people realized that the grade 9 students seemed much more eager to try out a problem if it was an erasable whiteboard rather than a piece of chart paper because then they were not so hesitant to make mistakes. So that's why you have whiteboards, because um, we're trying to model some of the things. But those whiteboards grew. So that rather than a piece of chart paper, some schools went out and got big whiteboards like this to put on the table. And then the whiteboards were all around the room, so that many of them were working on vertical non-permanent surfaces, where the whole class was up and working on the board. And again, not afraid to take risks and thinking became visible. So along with increased use of manipulatives, increased use of technology, the whiteboard seemed to be something um, that really encouraged the students to work. Some of the schools had class sets of iPads and were thinking about, so how could we use these iPads? How can we use them in pedagogically sound ways? We know there are tons of apps out there. But how can we use them in ways that enhance student thinking as opposed to our simply another multiple choice test that's fast paced and really just creates more anxiety? So uh, particular ways that they use them using Desmos, Nearpod, or videos through technology, such as the Dan Meyer videos or Joe Bowler videos, to stimulate a discussion about growth mindset or to stimulate a problem. Rich tasks were huge. And a lot of the time that we spent together was talking about, so what is a rich task? We talked about rich tasks as having multiple entry points, as being um, able for students to approach them in a variety of different sorts of ways. Some teams were trying to develop a, a resource bank of rich tasks. And in fact, as a project, we had a wiki where we could post rich tasks. When we got together last summer for our summer institute, um, I think that was in August, we spent a day trying out different rich tasks. So all the school teams brought their tasks. We went through a carousel to try out different rich tasks. And a lot of the work was not just about finding them, but thinking about how do we use them? And what does student work look like? And what are some of the ideas um, that I might use to anticipate what student responses would be? So for some of the work around how to implement rich tasks, there were some book studies that were done in some of the groups. 
such as the book study using the Connecting Mathematical Ideas by Bowler and Humphreys or the Five Practices by Smith and Stein. So some tasks were sort of within one period. Some people decided a task might be within one period. I'm thinking of uh, Amy's discussion about her, that task that seemed to take a week or two um, that she thought might ta take a short time. And other people had project-based <coughs> learning that they planned to last over a long time, such as one school where the students designed a mini putt course. And each group worked on a separate whole of the mini putt course. So a lot of work in terms of doing that. Developing algebraic thinking was thread throughout. Measurement geometry, some of those other topics, linear relations, I can see how that would lend itself. What do we do about like algebra and algebraic manipulation? How do we fit that in? How do we approach that? And so some of the wrestling with that had to do with looking at how to approach it through a geometric lens and working with measurement and geometry, how to make it meaningful. Um, the discussion about the border problem also showed how they developed a way, or thinking about how do we move from patterning and algebra ideas to then think about algebraic solutions. So some talked about building algebraic structures. Um, I need to tell you, as much as, as we went out to do our research, I found that I gathered just as many ideas from the school teams, maybe more, as they got from us as a research team. So I remember being at one school and they were building algebraic structures out of um, sort of straws and connectors, but they also had these crazy forts. I had never heard of those. These huge things that one connects to build these big forts and they were building algebraic structures with these crazy forts. Well, I think I went to the, uh, I was flying home from visiting that school. I sat in the airport and ordered two sets of those. Actually, three sets, one for each grandkid and one for me. Um, to think about how can I use these to be able to build algebraic structures. And it was just fascinating. So that's a simple structure of an x squared. But they posed questions such as, so what would x cubed look like? What would 2x cubed look like? What are different ways I could build 3x cubed? So that's something to think about. So I found that quite interesting, those different approaches to algebraic structures. Or, as I mentioned, working with something like the border problem that led to a rich investigation of the sense of a variable, different ways that we can use variables to represent expressions, and then how can we compare expressions um, to be able to see whether or not they're actually equivalent. So interesting, the whole wrestling with algebra, because we really are building a sound sense of algebraic ideas in grades 7 through to 9 and 10, and it's important that we build that solid foundation.